Whenever I want to learn how a movie is put together, one of the first things I do is get a pen and paper and just count the shots. Seriously. It's not very technical and it's a bit tedious, but just tallying every time there's a cut forces you to see things in a different way. It kills the illusion just enough that the nuts and bolts start to come into view. For example, let's take a look at P.T. Anderson's There Will Be Blood. Already by the third shot, I noticed a camera technique that would be used again and again throughout the film, this heavy emphasis on double and triple framing in single shots. Anderson and cinematographer Robert Elswit were clearly interested in making a movie comprised largely of long takes, but they keep up the momentum by collapsing multiple shots into one. Things never drag on or get too boring, which is definitely a consideration when your movie is two and a half hours long. In fact, by the end of the 14 and a half minute dialogue free introduction, I was struck by the length of the shots and by how few there actually were, 73 to be exact. And 14 and a half minutes divided by 73 means that each shot on average was about 12 seconds long. That's a really long average shot length by today's standard and something I wasn't expecting Anderson to keep up throughout the rest of the film. This graph, by the way, showing that average shot lengths have decreased over the years comes from the work of Barry Salt, who's been writing about film metrics since the 60s and 70s. And if you want to dive deeper into metrics like these, I highly recommend visiting his website, Cinemetrics, where all kinds of data is listed out for literally thousands of movies. But I think the best insights come from doing the counting yourself. For example, one of the things that occurs to you watching There Will Be Blood like this is that the value of a simple cut increases as the number of cuts decreases. It's amazing how impactful a cut can be when you're not watching them happen at breakneck speed. I don't mean to say that films with more cuts are necessarily worse or better, just that a movie like There Will Be Blood finds a lot of power in a common cinematic device. The moment you make a decision, it's it's very it's in in stark relief to the audience, and there's there's um, a lot of uh, a big spotlight on now I'm changing perspective now I'm telling you something else with so few cuts as Tikhonor says the contrast of each is dialed up considerably and like Daniel Plainview Anderson and Tikhonor mine that contrast for meaning a lot of times it's literal cutting between dark frames and bright frames or loud moments and quiet ones <laughs> Just a quick side note, this sequence right here, by the way, shots 256 to 263 are the quickest cutting in the film by far. Anderson used so few shots that Tikhonor had to find ways to artificially add more cuts to build up the momentum of this moment. You can actually see that shots 258 and 260 are just alternate angles of the shots that came before them. It's really good editing. Anyway, other times the contrast is personal. If you wanted to suggest that two characters were different sides of the same coin, for example, arch rivals but cut from the same cloth, all you need is two shots. One, tracking into a character, mumbling to himself, bathed in light. Another, tracking out from a character, mumbling to himself, covered in shadow. What I realized after a while is that there's a domino effect. Longer takes mean more impactful cuts, mean more attention to composition. And if you want your framing to mean something, then your cuts have to mean something because the cut is where the viewer really sees the framing. And they see it with a fresh memory, almost an after image of the frame that came before. Sometimes it is actually a memory. And if you want your cuts to mean something, then you have to use them sparingly and with care. Every single shot is filled with a kind of anticipation because these cuts are registered consciously on the viewer's mind. We're all waiting for the next one to come. Can everything around here be gone? Sure. P.T. Anderson knows that anticipation is just a form of focus, and he's great at channeling that heightened focus toward the performances. And when you have an actor as magnetic as Daniel Day-Lewis, the longer the take, the more you hang on his every word and pause. I see the worst in people, Henry. I don't need to look past seeing them to get all I need. Watching this movie, I noticed that conversations like this are the place with the most frequent editing on average, a necessity of shot reverse shot. But even here, everything is deliberate. This sequence, for example, is 16 shots and three and a half minutes. Tikhonor holds firm on the wide until Eli makes the key comment. What is it that brought you here, sir? Good Lord's guidance. Now, of course, within that, we're gonna develop a lease. 
He cuts in, but only a little, while Daniel thinks he's still dealing with the father. Then when it's clear Eli is the prime negotiator, the scene locks on close-ups as they battle back and forth. And though I don't know for sure, it looks a lot like Tikanor extended the silences here to augment the intensity. That's good. It works. Giving the shots breathing room on both sides of the dialogue, far from making the scene drag, dials up the emotion considerably. And this is something Anderson does throughout the film. Close-ups are used again and again for moments of silence, just as much for important pieces of dialogue. P.T. Anderson, like the Coen brothers, is great at casting for faces, and he wants us to watch them as much as listen. And of course, he wants us to watch Daniel Plainview the most, who corrodes with bitterness across a series of close-ups, even as he finds success in the solitude that he craves. I drink your water. I drink it up. Every day, I drink the blood of lamb from bandage track. There are 678 shots in There Will Be Blood. Over two and a half hours, that means that each shot is 13.3 seconds on average, more than the introduction. The movie is remarkably consistent on this front. Each hour or half hour taken alone will average somewhere around 12 to 14 seconds. Maybe this is what gives the movie its steady but unrelenting pace, the feeling that you're watching a train you can't stop. There are tons of ways to deconstruct a movie, but it's amazing what you can learn just from looking at the shots one by one as they go by. But for many of us, loving a film means wanting to know how it works. With the spirit of an engineer, we take it apart, twist it, turn it, bend it, and put it back together. Or at least we try to. A great movie will never give up all its secrets, but it will give up some of them. This episode was brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is an on-demand video learning service, which basically means it's got around 7,000 online video lecture series from some great professors about all kinds of subjects, math, history, archaeology, art, you name it. One that I think you should really check out is called The Inexplicable Universe Unsolved Mysteries by Neil deGrasse Tyson, which is super heady and interesting, and it's taught by Neil Tyson, which is all you should need to know. If you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash nerdwriter or click the link in the description, you can get a 30-day free trial. After that, annual memberships are $14.99 a month and monthly memberships are $19.99 a month. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you next time.